wrote a paper on the labour theory of value. And this paper is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, it provides a generalisation of the classical definition of labour values, which Passanetti calls the hyper-integrated labour coefficients. Second, it provides a complete generalisation of Marx's transformation problem. So in this talk, I will briefly review Passanetti's paper. Then I'll define a further generalisation of labour values, the super-integrated labour coefficients, and I'll demonstrate how they provide a general solution to Marx's transformation problem. In closing, I'll discuss Passanetti's restriction of the labour theory of value to a normative theory, a kind of logical frame of reference. Okay, so Passanetti defines in his 1988 paper, a linear production model with capital investment to meet growing demand and non-uniform growth across the sectors. He splits the economy into N hyper subsystems. Now, the concept of a hyper subsystem generalizes Schraffer's concept of a subsystem, which he introduced in his book, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. A hypersubsystem is a vertically integrated and therefore self-contained slice of an economy that produces a single consumption good as output and also produces the means of production and the net investment necessary for its expansion at a given growth rate. Passive then defines a natural price system for each hypersubsystem. And these natural prices are defined in terms of what Passanetti calls natural profit rates. And the natural profit rate is equal to the growth rate of each of the hyper subsystems. So if there are n hyper subsystems, there are n natural profit rates. Each hyper subsystem is entirely self-contained with its own prices and its own natural profit rate. Now, Passanetti shows that, in general, the natural prices are not proportional to classical labour values. In other words, classical labour values can't explain the cost structure of the hypersubsystems. Passanetti's next step is, I believe, an innovation. He proposes to generalise the classical definition of labour costs to additionally include the costs of producing capital investment goods. And he calls these labour costs the vertically hyper-integrated labour coefficients. Now, classical labour values measure the direct and indirect labour required to reproduce commodities. In contrast, Passanetti's hyper-coefficients measure the direct, indirect and hyper-indirect labour required to reproduce commodities, and where hyper-indirect refers to the labour supplied to produce investment goods. Now it turns out that the natural prices of the hyper-subsystems are proportional to Passanetti's hyper-coefficients. Hence, labour costs suitably generalised can explain the cost structure of the natural prices in each hyper subsystem. Passanetti writes that this result, uh, begin quote, is a complete generalization of the pure labor theory of value, end quote. In fact, Passanetti's result recreates Adam Smith's early and rude state of society where labor embodied equals labor commanded. Now, the important point is that to reveal the duality between natural prices and labour costs, in this context, Passanetti had to generalise the classical concept of labour costs. Now Passanetti switches tack and he considers a single natural price structure for the whole integrated economy. So now we're not thinking about hyper subsystems, we're thinking about the integrated economy and global competitive prices with a single uniform profit rate. 
these competitive prices correspond to an institutional setup where capitalist owners reallocate their capital between sectors searching for the best returns. Passenetti shows that, in general, these competitive prices are not proportional to the hyper-integrated labour coefficients. Hence, even after we've generalised labour costs to include the hyper-indirect labour, we cannot reduce these prices to labour costs. Passanetti therefore claims, quite correctly, that his analysis constitutes a complete generalisation of Marx's transformation problem. And he concludes that, begin quote, a theory of value in terms of pure labour can never reflect the price structure that emerges from the market in a capitalist economy. And in, and in, and in, in consequence, Passanetti restricts the labour theory of value to a normative or logical frame of reference which is not directly applicable to economic reality. So that's a brief summary of Passanetti's 1988 paper. Um, I want to now turn to critically analysing Passanetti's argument and ask the simple question, is this right? So in my paper, I analyse Passanetti's uh, non-uniform growth model. The algebra is reasonably complex, so in this talk, I will simplify and concentrate on a special case of Passanetti's model, which is simple reproduction, which should be familiar to everyone here. The argument will therefore be easier to follow, but please refer to the full paper for the complete analysis. So now to step through the relationship between labour costs and a standard production price equation, the kind you'll find in Straffer's work, for example. And here it is. We can expand this equation for production prices as an infinite series of terms, where each term is a labour cost multiplied by a compound profit factor. Now, in this special case of zero profits, production prices are proportional to classical labour values, but in general, they are not. Production prices, therefore, are not completely reducible to labour costs. There is a profit residual that varies independently of classical labour values. Now, let's look at simple reproduction from the point of view of quantities rather than prices. Consider that the net product of the system is distributed in the form of the real wage W and capitalist consumption C. We therefore have this quantity equation that describes the economy. In a self-reproducing state, the distribution of nominal income specified by the profit and wage rate is sufficient to purchase the real income specified by bundles W and C. In fact, the price and the quantity equations together imply this equation here, where the left-hand side is the sum of profit income and wage income, income and the right-hand side is the price of the net product. Assume further that workers and capitalists spend what they earn. In consequence, wage income equals the cost of the real wage and profit income equals the cost of capitalist consumption. Now, once we consider the distribution of income, both in real and nominal terms, some important conclusions necessarily follow. So from the previous slide, the profit rate is the ratio of capitalist income to investment. So let's substitute this expression into the production price equation. Now expand the term in brackets by multiplying by PA. Next, factor out prices P, and we get this term, C transpose PA, within the brackets, which is a matrix. We've therefore derived this equivalent expression for production prices, which features the matrix C. This is an M by M matrix with each element 
given by this expression at the bottom of the slide, which is a ratio of two price terms multiplied by a component of capitalists' real consumption. What is this matrix C? Well, this expression here is the profit income generated by the sale of one unit of commodity J. This expression is the quantity of commodity I distributed to capitalists per unit of their profit income. It follows that each element Cij is the quantity of commodity I distributed to capitalists per unit output of commodity J. In other words, matrix C is a capitalist consumption matrix that specifies how the production of output is synchronized with the distribution of goods from sectors to capitalist household. And note that matrix C is a physical input-output matrix. It specifies relative material flows of commodities, and each element of C has the exact same units as its corresponding element in the technology matrix A. So that was a simplified brief argument, which I want to now recap. We started with production prices. Then, given a distribution of real income, we derived an equivalent expression for production prices, which features a capitalist consumption matrix. Now, production prices in this representation comprise the costs of means of production, PA, the cost of maintaining the capitalist class at its conventional level of consumption, PC, and the cost of labor, LW. We therefore have an alternative but equivalent infinite series representation of production prices, which reduces them to a sum of labor costs, including the labor cost of producing capitalist consumption goods. The point is that the profit rate has gone and it's been replaced by a real variable, the capitalist consumption matrix C. And in consequence, production prices are completely reducible to a sum of labor costs. In fact, we've proved a theorem. Define non-standard labor values as tilde V equals tilde V tilde A plus L, where matrix tilde A is the technique augmented by capitalist consumption. These non-standard labor values measure the direct, indirect, and super-indirect labor required to reproduce unit commodities, where super-indirect labor refers to the labor supplied to produce the capitalist consumption goods. And we prove the following equivalence theorem. Given an economy with production prices, and quantities specified by the equation in the slide, and zero saving, that is workers and capitalists spend what they earn, then production prices are proportional to non-standard labor values. In other words, the production prices are the total wage bill of the direct, indirect, and super indirect labor required to produce commodities. So once we measure in terms of non-standard labor values, then the labor commanded by a commodity equals the label labor embodied in it. So in consequence, the nominal cost structure is entirely dual to the real cost structure. Now, does this equivalence between equilibrium prices and labor costs hold outside the special case of simple reproduction. In fact, there's a whole family of equivalence theorems of which only a small proportion have been stated. The first equivalence theorem probably originates with Adam Smith and his root state of society. Even critics of the labor theory of value acknowledge that prices are proportional to classical labor values in the absence of Smith's profits on stock. We've proved an equivalence theorem for the case of profits on stock in the context of simple reproduction. To discover the equivalence, we needed to generalize the classical definition of labor value 
to include the labour cost of producing capitalist consumption goods. Passanetti proved the equivalence between natural prices and hyper-integrated coefficients for his growing hyper-subsystems. And to achieve this result, he generalized classical labor values to include the labor cost of producing net investment goods, which he called the hyper-indirect labor. Passanetti, however, did not discover an equivalence uh, in his integrated growth model. In my paper for this conference, I prove equivalence in Passanetti's model between competitive prices and what I call the super-integrated labor coefficients. These coefficients include the direct, indirect, hyper and super-indirect labor required to produce commodities, where again, super-indirect refers to the labor supply to produce capitalist consumption. Now, these different definitions of labor costs are in order of increasing generality. And it's easy to show that classical labor values are a special case of non-standard labor values, which in turn are a special case of the super-integrated labor coefficients. And in the case of Adam Smith's rude state of society, all these definitions collapse back to classical labor values. So what's the implication of all this? Well, the implications for the classical theory of value are important and far-reaching. Passanetti interpreted his negative result as providing a complete generalization of Marx's transformation problem. Our new positive result provides a general solution to it and related logical problems in the classical labor theory of value. For example, Marx knew that production prices don't represent classical labor values in a simple and direct manner. But neither do they represent a reweighting of classical labor values as he sketched in volume three of Capital. In general, natural price structures represent total labor costs. Where total labor costs are total in the sense that they reduce all real costs to labor costs. Now, classical labor values are a measure of total labor values in the absence of profits on stock. That's why the pure labor theory of value works in this case. But in general, classical labor values don't measure total labor costs. And that's why logical problems start to appear when they're compared to more general cost structures. Now, there's a deep conceptual problem at the heart of the classical labor theory of value, which I call the classical category mistake. And it's very simple to state. Production price prices count the nominal income of capitalists as a component of price. Classical labor values emit the real income of capitalists as a component of labor costs. In other words, the dual systems of price and labor values employ different cost accounting conventions. Now, we commit a category mistake when we expect some concept or thing to possess properties it cannot have. The classical authors, such as Ricardo or Marx, commit a category mistake when they expect their partial measure of labor costs to be commensurate with a total measure of money costs. And this expectation has to be confounded since only a total measure of labor costs can possess such a property. And we can show that all the classical contradictions of the labor theory of value derive from this basic and deep unexamined conceptual error. But once we've caught the error, we can avoid it. So back to Passanetti's 1988 paper. It turns out that Passanetti's hyper-integrated labor coefficients are a partial measure of labor costs for his integrated growth model. That's why he discovers a complete generalization of Marx's transformation problem when he compares these coefficients to the price system. But as we'd now expect, 
this transformation problem disappears once we measure total labor costs, which in this context are the super integrated labor coefficients. Pasnetti therefore provides a complete generalization of Marx's transformation problem only by reproducing at a higher level of generality the underlying classical category mistake. It follows therefore as a matter of logic that Pasnetti's restriction of the labor theory of value to a normative theory, a kind of logical frame of reference, is unwarranted. Okay, that's me finished. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm currently writing up my PhD thesis, but some of the material is already online in the form of working papers, and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank thanks for listening.